I mean, the L infinity norm of 2D probability bounded by uh, the L2 norm of solution itself. Okay, and then by, I mean, I know the, the, the average of V2 on B1 is less or equal to one, so on B1 half is bounded by some constant C0. So now for the contradiction, you want to choose a theta so that uh, uh, C0, uh, theta to the power four is less than theta to the power two plus two sigma. Sigma is less than one. It's less than one. So remember that C0 here depends only on the dimension and the ellipticity constant mu. It doesn't, so therefore the choice of a theta only depends on the dimension and uh, ellipticity ellipticity, con ellipticity constant mu there. And that's the end of the proof for the first lemma. Do you have any questions? I do have a question. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's in the compactness. Okay, I might have forgotten yeah. that, but um, now that I think about it, I'm not sure like, how, because like, in, in one dimension, I might agree that A naught, the homogeneous, effective homogeneous homogenization is constant. Uh, I might agree with that on dimension one, but for the dimension two, or greater than that, I just don't understand why it should be a constant. Oh, uh, the, first of all, A hat is a constant. And A0 is the limit of A hat, so it's a, it's a limit of a constant. So, uh, it, so if you only take one, you're going to have uh, just A0 equal to A hat. But if you have a sequence, it will still be a, a constant uh, matrix. So, yes, that's right. Yeah, A hat uh, is the effective matrix that's a constant. So for each K, it's already a constant. So you take the limit, it's still a constant matrix. Yeah, so this limit here is just the limit in the Euclidean space, d by d. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so that, that, that's the end of the proof. So <coughs> compactness theorem. Uh, so basically what this shows, it, it tells you, the compactness theorem just tells you that <coughs> is that if the limit is good, your sequence is not too bad. That, that's the idea. So the limit here has C2 regularity, well, 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 and uh, here we prove the sequence actually is uniform ellipses. So that, that's the idea here. All right, so, but this is not enough. In the second step, we're going to iterate this, okay? In the first step, this is a one, so-called one-step improvement. You only got a little bit, uh, that's not gonna be enough. In the second step, we're gonna eat, just simply iterate, it's a, this is an induction argument, and uh, so, Sigma, again, is, is a number greater than zero less than one, and this uh, epsilon zero and, and the theta are the number produced by the first lemma. Okay, now you have a solution B1, okay? And now epsilon is much smaller, not just less than epsilon zero, but less than epsilon zero multiplies theta to the power k minus one. So, so, so theta is less than one, so this, uh, <coughs> Epsilon could be much smaller than epsilon zero, depending on how this uh, k goes. All right, then there, there, are, uh, two s uh, there are two numbers. One is a scalar, another is a vector. And so that when you average uh, this on a ball of radius epsilon theta to the power k, this is the same k as here, u epsilon minus E k is a constant here. Uh, this is the same thing. It's a linear function plus the characters rescaled. So this guy is a solution. Uh, multiply by a vector, a constant vector H k. This will be less than uh, theta to the power two plus two sigma times k times the L1 average, L2 average of, uh, L1 average of U epsilon squared. And further I have control on this HK, uh, it's less than uh, sigma L from one to K, and say that's the power sigma L times the L2, aver L2 average of U epsilon. Okay, certainly theta is less than one, and this is a geometric series here which converge, but I want to stay there, put a K here, doesn't want to go to infinity. Okay, so, uh, so this is the, 
uh, second step, uh, iteration, which you're gonna, we're going to see the proof uh, now, and, uh, and then we'll see how to use uh, this uh, uh, estimate to prove the large-scale Lipschitz estimate in theory here. All right, so, so the proof is done by induction on K. Uh, the case K equal to one is already given by the first lemma. It's precisely the statement in the first lemma. Okay, and now we, uh, we do the, uh, the induction uh, argument. Suppose it's true for K, we want to prove for K plus one. All right, so, that, uh, so we have a solution uh, in B1, where epsilon is smaller than epsilon zero times theta to the K plus one minus one, so the, K, the power here is, 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 is K now. All right, so how do you, how do you, how do you uh, apply uh, uh, lemma one. So you do that by rescale. So you introduce a function v, so you, you rescale by, by just change the variable from x to x times theta to the k. And then you're going to, of course, change everything else uh, in, the, in the formula, of course, constant, constant k will stay the same. Okay, so this constant uh, x, ek and uh, hk is a, was a constant for the step k. And then you have to change the variable in this formula here. So variable x becomes ck times x, and now you have to change the same asset here. Okay, so the, the observation is that when you scale the solution, the parameter of the equation scales accordingly. So in other words, when you scale here, put the theta to the power k, the epsilon becomes epsilon over theta to the power k. Okay, that's a, just a rescaling property of the operator, and I, uh, I mentioned that in my lecture notes. That's a very important uh, property which allow us to do rescaling argument. Uh, all the time, okay? So it's less, it's, it's gonna be a solution. V is gonna be a, be, a, be a solution, but for a different parameter. This new parameter, now you derive its epsilon over theta k, and because of this assumption, it satisfies the condition in the first lemma. So in other words, now we can apply the first lemma to the function v with parameter epsilon over theta k. Because it satisfies all the conditions there. So, th so if you write this out, you end up with this, or this, this line, this inequality. This is just by the first lemma. Everything is in terms of v, okay? So v here, but you need to change the parameter to epsilon over theta k. So this, this is how it changed, and uh, so it's theta is the same here, okay? And then w the induction assumption allow us to bound the, uh, the average of a v square by the average of u epsilon square. And you come up with this uh, uh, factor here. So you add up, you already, so in the first step, gave, the first lemma gave you a factor s theta to the power two plus two sigma, but the induction gave you another power two plus two sigma multiplied by k, so you put it together, it becomes k plus one. Okay? So, so now you, you change everything back from V to U epsilon, and uh, you uh, justify your constant. You'll see that uh, the K plus one, HK plus one, is HK plus this new term, the extra term, but this extra term is under control. Again, this inequality is, by, is actually uh, by the uh, by the first lemma here, actually I have here. So, so, so now, uh, okay, so that, that is the proof of the second lemma. Sorry, on the second step you have to change back to be theta to turn into variables? Uh, here. So you have to check average over B1. Yeah, yeah, so, so here you, uh, 
the average of uh, uh, v square, you look at what is uh, a, a, a v here, and you integrate uh, um, b1 Let's see. So yeah, you s the, if this step is simply the, the uh, induction argument there. It's not by the first, so this one is not by the first lemma, but, but by the induction assumption that uh, the, the, the lemma is true for, for integer k. It's not by the first lemma, yeah. All right, so, for, so let's see how, so that's the proof of the second lemma. Now let's see how do you use this second lemma to prove the interior estimate. Okay, so, so now you, you take a solution in a unit ball, and you take R, as I said, you can, you can assume R is, is, less, is small, but greater than epsilon. Okay, and you choose a, a right k, so this R, it sits between uh, this power of uh, sigma k plus one and power of uh, sigma. And then you look at what uh, the average of a, a gradient u epsilon square on BR. Uh, you, first of all, you use a Cartopoli because uh, Cartopoli holds for bounding measurable coefficients. So you, you don't want to work with a gradient, but you work with, want to with a, a function. The Cartopoli here, you want to subtract a constant. And that's because the subtract constant is still a solution, but the gradient doesn't change. Okay, so that is the, just the Cartopoli here. And then uh, the second step is that is you, add, you subtract and, and add a term. So this is just a triangle. It's nothing more than triangle here. Okay, so now you have two terms, and the first term will be estimated by the second lemma. You, you generate this power here. Remember, R is uh, roughly uh, theta to the power k. And uh, for the second term, uh, you have a control on, uh, on hk. Well, for now, you just uh, copy the hk square. But this integral here is bounded by a constant. And let's see why is that case. Here, first of all, you have a linear term. Uh, the ball is centered at origin, so x is less than uh, r, r, theta k. Uh, theta k is r, so cancel out uh, this r square. But then we know that epsilon is greater than r, so uh, epsilon over r is less than one, so, so this integral is bounded by constant. Hk is, it's, uh, HK is, uh, is bounded uh, because of that uh, estimate in lemma, in lemma two B for the, it's the geometric series. So, so both of these sort of term are, are control. So this is a BR, this is a B1. That's the end of the proof for, for, for the theorem. Any questions? Okay, so um, well, you can you can uh, uh, translate the ball and dilate the ball, and you doesn't have to be a center at origin or a radius one. So now you have suppose you have a solution in an arbitrary ball, assuming the coefficient is elliptic, periodic, and Hilda continuous, and uh, then the L infinite norm on the on the ball of half of the radius. Uh, of the gradient of the solution is bounded uh, uniformly by the L2 average rate scale. I mean, you have to multiply by, divide this by R because this you have a gradient here, and then you have to multiply by R because the scaling F LP norm uh, here. So that is the, the interior estimate. Okay, so the, uh, I want to come back to, before I move on to the boundary uh, estimate, I want to come back to this lemma two here. Uh, you might see some similar thing happened in other courses. You can recast this 
estimate in the following way. So you take an infimum uh, over E, the so vector in, uh, in R, D, and H in R, all right? And you look at this uh, rescaled, uh, say there, uh, this, is a, this is a BR, uh, U epsilon minus H minus uh, X plus epsilon times the character, then uh, E, E here, this is a dot product, squared, and this is bounded by, okay, B1, U epsilon squared, okay? So that is actually, is, is what we prove in this uh, uh, second lemma here. Uh, I said in the beginning there's no C1 alpha estimate. I take that back. There is a C1 alpha estimate, but it just takes it in a different form. So in other words, you, don't, you subtract a constant, then you, sub, sub, you subtract an inner term, but you have to add a corrector in this place. So you can call this a large scale C1 alpha estimate. So the R here has to be greater than epsilon less or equal to one, okay? The solution is in a unit ball here. So this is how the C1 alpha estimate look like in, ellipti I mean in homogenization here, okay? You can actually use this uh, estimate to prove uh, Liouville theorem. Uh, I'll mention that. Uh, it's not in the notes, but I want to just put, put it here and see some applications. So here is a, a, a Liouville property. So uh, suppose that A is, uh, A is elliptic and uh, periodic. I do not need smoothness. This works for bounded measurable coefficients, okay? And suppose you have a in entire solution locally in H1, let's say LU, you can, in the whole space, it doesn't really matter you put a epsilon or not, you take it because you, you just rescale to epsilon equal to one, equal to zero in the whole space, okay? And uh, you assume that uh, the, the, the solution does not grow uh, more than uh, a power of, uh, of the radius. So there, 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 there are two constants which depend on the solution could be uh, such that, such that the uh, So the average, say, above uh, radius r, u epsilon, well, just epsilon equal to one in this case, is less or equal to a constant cu, r to the power of one plus sigma for all r greater or equal to one, okay? So in particular, you can allow linear growth, oh, but not quadratic. So then there exists C0, C1, up to CD in R such that the solution U must be a constant plus CJ, XJ plus K 
chi j of x, and we know this is a solution, of course, okay? Constant is a solution. For each j, this is a solution. You multiply by constant, it's another solution. And this theorem tells you that if the solution, if you have an entire solution which is uh, uh, grows less than quadratic, then it must be a solution of this form. So that's a Liouville theorem. This, this is also true for systems, as I said here. Well, they, they, they prove uh, is you simply rescale this estimate. All right, so you, you take, well, if you rescale that, so you take, uh, okay, so if, if I rescale this estimate, you'll see that uh, if I just take epsilon equal to 1 and, and r is greater than 1 but less than r, uh, then you, uh, and that estimate is equivalent to uh, 1 over r, say br u epsilon minus h minus x plus uh, chi of x dot with dot with uh, e. It's less or equal to c alpha. Then let's see. I want no. So I want r over r to the power alpha. Then you have one over r b r u squared and one half, okay? So that uh, you'll see, if you, you, if you have an entire solution, which is, this is, and here alpha can be any number between zero and one. So if you have an entire solution which satisfy this growth condition here, and uh, you fix R, you fix R, fix R, and you let the capital R goes to infinity. And this, the right-hand side will go to zero. And this tells you that on each ball of radius R, the solution, well, each one is one, and U is just this function for some H, for some E. And then you can certainly expand the ball into a, so that's to show that uh, in the whole space is, is of this form. So that's what uh, the second lemma uh, give it to you. And uh, I think that this is uh, actually an advantage of using compactness method compared to the method we're going to talk about um, uh, talk about tomorrow there uh, by convergence rate. So this, although the, the, the application might be limited, but it does give you actual information uh, compared to the method by convergence rate. Uh, We'll talk about that tomorrow. Any questions? All right, so, uh, okay, so let's move on to the uh, boundary estimate. Okay, so we're gonna look at a DD class problem. Uh, oh, so my time is almost over. Uh, I'll just, uh, so you have a, so now you have a solution in a bounded domain. I'm assuming omega is C1 alpha, and so we want to show this estimate. So the idea is that how do we uh, carry out this compactness uh, argument to the boundary setting here? So the key observation is that uh, because of the boundary data, introduce a boundary layer. Something has to be done in order to deal with that boundary layer, okay? Uh, the reason is that when you, I mean, there's no problem with the first step. 
It's a problem with the second term, second step in iteration. As you keep doing this, the boundary error adds up if you use the interior character. By interior character, I mean the character chi. So, uh, so the idea is I introduce something called a boundary character. So in the Dirichlet case, it's called a Dirichlet character. So how, what's the definition? It's a, it's a, and now the character will depend on the domain, omega. Uh, and you solve a boundary value problem in omega with a linear function on the boundary, with data is a linear function. Certainly, this solution exists because a linear function, it's, it's uh, in any class you can think of, <laughs> okay? And so the idea is that, so if you, if you, if you look at this uh, uh, function phi minus a linear function, it, 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 at least on the operator level, it behaves like a corrector rescaled, okay? However, this uh, uh, boundary corrector minus the linear function vanishes on the boundary. As opposed to this guy here, it's not going to be vanished, although epsilon small, but it can add up. So this, this uh, deleterial corrector minus this just, just vanish on the boundary here. So this program was carried out uh, by Feng Hua uh, and uh, Valinda. And uh, in a paper I mentioned uh, in 87, uh, they show that uh, uh, the, the corrector, in order to, to, to carry this compactness, first of all, you have to a priori prove that uh, the Dirichlet corrector is, is Lipschitz, is uniformly Lipschitz in epsilon. Here, so this is actually the, the, the key step here. Uh, I'll, I'll just go over this very quickly, how do you do it? First of all, you use compactness to prove the boundary Hilder estimate. If you want to prove boundary Hilder estimate, you do not need a corrector. You just carry over with just subtract a constant. And, uh, and then once you have a Hilder estimate, you can use that to prove uh, estimate for Green's functions. So that shows that the Green's function decays on the boundary of any order alpha, alpha less one. The Green's function is Hilder continuous uh, up to the boundary, okay? So then you use the estimate on the Green's function and some representation form to show that if you have a Dirichlet problem with a boundary data G, you can actually prove some preliminary form. So you average this solution of ball radius r greater than epsilon. In the right-hand side, you can put some extra term. Uh, this is the gradient of g, L infinity norm, and plus uh, a g, but you have an epsilon to the power of negative one. Uh, here, g is on the boundary, but we can certainly extend this to the interior. Okay, so this is one of the key steps. And uh, once you have that step, you're going to use the compactness argument in this setting here. Okay, so it's D1 is just the ball intersect with uh, the domain omega. Uh, delta 1 is the surface ball. So you, you, uh, you, uh, you localize to, to a neighborhood of a fixed point uh, on the boundary. And uh, so, so D, dr is just say b, let's say zero, the origin is on the boundary, r intersect omega, and then the delta r is b r intersect the boundary of omega, okay? So this is the, the key uh, to set this up here. Uh, okay, so uh, there, there similar program is carried out for the Neumann problem here. Uh, the, the, the key step is to uh, introduce uh, the Neumann corrector and the proof the Neumann corrector uh, is Lipschitz up to the boundary. And here it's, uh, okay. So I will just stop here. Thank you.